Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship this morning, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and it's July 17th. And Jesus loves you. Thank you. The, uh, the noisy offering this summer is going towards our summer serenade music. That's the bucket, and you're welcome to drop some coins in there. Well, our ladies met this last week, and they are planning a brunch. And uh, it sounds like it's going to be very delicious, but the brunch is set for Sunday, August 14th, after the morning worship. And you can look for details in the newsletter, which should be coming out this coming week. And um, we have continuous communion this morning. We have, uh, we, I have decided to do our children's sermon online. So we have posted the children's sermon. I'm going to try to do that from now on. I think we've got a lot of hits already, and people have been sharing that, and I think it's being well received. So uh, rather than, we don't know if kids are going to be here or not, we're going to do the children's sermon uh, on Facebook so you can catch that. And yes, you are welcome to share that with your grandkids uh, and your great-grandkids and your great-great, <laughs> whatever you want to do with that. Um, the Fairtime Chapel is looking for volunteers for the Barron County Fair this coming week, and I there's a letter that I posted if you're interested in helping out with the fair time chapel and we have a birthday girl this morning Lucy happy birthday Lucy do you want to stand up and wave to everybody so they can see who you are (laughs) so we're going to sing happy birthday to her Uh, It is tomorrow. Her official birthday is tomorrow, but this is her her church family, so we're going to sing happy birthday to her. You got the music? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lucy. Happy birthday to you. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Now we wish you many more, Lucy. Okay. We welcome everybody that's watching uh, live streaming and on Facebook this morning. And I thought we're going to, uh, rather than just say hi or wave, we're going to pass the peace. We haven't done that in a long time. You know, we kind of let it go by the wayside because of COVID, but let's turn around and uh, this is the peace sign. Remember that? (laughs) So let's turn around and then those of you who are watching, you have to give the peace sign back. So let's turn around at our camera and give the peace sign. Peace be with you. (laughs) Wonderful. Let us stand as you're able for our invocation and confession of sins. We begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we too often passed by the other side. Set us again on the path of life, save us from ourselves, and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves us. Amen. We sing our opening hymn printed in your bulletin.
join me in praying the prayer of the day. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence that we may treasure your word above all else through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 10a. The Lord appeared to Abram by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor, with you, do not pass your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after, you have, after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. Here ends the reading. We will read from Psalm 15 responsibly. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? <clears throat> they do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon the neighbor. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or power. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the first fruit born from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the, his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. For 
provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from hope, from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel as you are able. The gospel of the Lord according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Now as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, <clears throat> he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. <clears throat> but Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is a need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You be seated. <clears throat> This morning, I'm going to be reflecting on our gospel lesson, and I've entitled my message, The Mary and Martha Debate, Making a Difference. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as you look down upon us, you see that we are just some very busy people. We're full of, uh, we have full schedules all week long. And now, uh, at this point on Sunday morning, we have taken time to come to listen to you and how good it is to hear your word. May we be reminded in this story this morning between Mary and Martha that you give us the good portion too. Help us to understand why we need that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, our story is about Jesus visiting in a home between uh, a couple ladies, uh, two sisters, Mary and Martha. And interestingly, this uh, kind of stirs up an argument between these two women. Actually, there's uh, a disagreement going on even before this story, and over the years, we have countless more arguments in discussing what this story really is all about. So let me begin by asking a couple of questions. How many of you, of you have had disagreements in your home at dinner time? There's a few people. <laughs> How many of you have had the feeling in your home that you're, you're doing all the work? <laughs> well, 
how do we get a handle on the, the disagreements? How do we, if you have a disagreement between two sisters, a husband and wife, wife and kids, husband and kids, how do you get a handle on that disagreement? Do you talk directly to the person about it? Or do you go through a third person to see and you talk behind their back? All right, so there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And we see in, uh, in this particular situation a, uh, a situation that, that develops that involves Jesus because Jesus is, is in the home. And of course, uh, Mary, God, God bless her, is sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha, God bless her, she wants to welcome Jesus and the disciples into her home. And what is she thinking? I got to get the lamb and the rice together so I can feed this group of people. And she's in the kitchen and working her head off, and she's looking, where's Mary? And she looks out, and she sees there's Mary. She's sitting at Jesus' feet. And so she comes into the, uh, the living area where all the disciples were, and she addresses Jesus. And, she said, and she, uh, she's got a little ire here. She's almost protesting. It comes out like this. Lord, don't you care? I'm doing all this work, and here's my sister sitting here listening to you. Can't you tell her to get up and help me? Now, isn't this a real family issue? Isn't that what happens a lot? As kids, we've probably gone through this with our siblings, wondering where our sibling was when I'm doing all the work and vice versa. There's a lot of family dynamics. This is a real life issue. But Jesus now is addressed. Mary, or Mary is not addressed by Martha about coming in and helping. Instead, she goes directly to Jesus. She goes to someone who is there, and she thinks she can get better results from Jesus than she can get from Mary. So you see that dynamic going on. And... Uh, we, we, uh, we know that Martha's working hard. You know, she's done all that preparation work. Goodness gracious, I don't even know all the preparation work that ladies take. You know, you've got to get those recipes out. You've got to figure out the right quantities for this and that. And then she's got to count all the people that are, that are there. Now oh, I've got to double and triple the recipe. Ladies, you know more about this than I do. So Jesus is confronted now with this Address by Martha. Should he reassure Martha that he does, in fact, care about what's going on in this situation? Should Jesus do that? Should he recognize that Jesus has a really good point here? Or maybe he should pull a Jesus like surprise and get up and go in the kitchen and help Martha? Or should he play the role of a peacemaker? Now, Martha, Martha, just cool it down a little bit. Mary, Mary is uh, sitting here, and she needs to hear this information. What should Jesus do? This is a real-life situation. Jesus doesn't say this in the scripture, but, you know, this is what a person goes through, thinking of different alternatives. But what does he do? He does something that is really unexpected. And this is what has bothered a lot of people when they read this story in the Bible. What Jesus does is so gently scold Martha. And then apparently takes Mary's side in dispute. And this is what he says. Martha, oh Martha, you're so worried and you're so distracted by so many things. But there is a need of one thing right now. And Mary has chosen it. And that thing is to listen to me. Now, if we're going to understand what this story is saying to us today, we have to grapple with this troublesome response by Jesus. Why does Jesus praise Mary over her hard work with worn-out Martha? Why does 
he say that Mary, who simply sits and listens, has chosen a better part than Martha, who is sweating and worrying and struggling over getting enough food ready. Why does Jesus praise Mary and defend her against Martha? Other people are arguing that what Jesus is doing is criticizing what we might call busy work Christianity. Busy work Christianity. That's what some scholars are saying. They think that Martha is so preoccupied with her little trivial chores, cooking, getting all the dishes ready, that she's missed the deeper spiritual point here. In their view, Jesus says to Martha, stop being so busy and start being more spiritual, Mary, like Mary. But we point out that this Mary Martha story comes just after last week's story about uh, Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke is trying to illustrate, some say that the theme we should love God and love our neighbors as ourselves is important. The Samaritan helped the man that was beaten on the side of the road by robbers. And Mary and Martha illustrates love of God. That's what Mary is doing, sitting at Jesus' feet. A good Samaritan, love your neighbor. Mary and Martha, love God. Now this is a, a struggle and a problem. We should be active, do things, but we're also to stop and listen to the good word of God, to his teaching. And so it kind of mixes together, loving God and love your neighbor. And so can we find a balance doing listening and then serving our neighbor? There's nothing wrong in and of itself with Mary fixing food. So this is what happens here on Sunday morning. We always have some volunteers that prepare coffee and cookies and goodies after the church service. But I have noticed these Marthas are also sitting here listening before they do that. Isn't that true? On any given Sunday, they're not back in the kitchen, but they're here listening. And then after the, the last uh, blessing, they scoot down <laughs> into the kitchen. So there's a balance, isn't there? Listening for God's good word for us and then doing and serving. Martha wanted to be hospitable. She cared a lot for all those that were there. But she needed to balance that with listening to what Jesus said. Jesus was only there for a short time, and Jesus had some great information to give to her. And Mary wanted to listen to God's word, but she could have said, Martha, when Jesus is done teaching us, I'm going to go in the kitchen and I'm going to help you. She could have said that, but that Bible verse doesn't say that. So I was a part of an advisory <clears throat> group of chaplains in, at the University of Minnesota Medical Hospital some years ago. And uh, what I and a couple other lead chaplains did was to listen to student chaplains as they encountered some of the university students. <clears throat> and uh, one of our elder chaplains asked the question, what are university students like morally these days? What are university students like morally these days? And um, one of the student chaplains said, well, a lot of them tutor kids after school. Some work at night in shelter in a soup kitchen for the homeless. And last week, a group of the students, this was some years ago, protested against apartheid in South Africa. And as she was talking, one of the, um, the uh, Jewish chaplains started smiling, almost laughing. 
And she saw him, and she said, what's so funny about all this? And he said, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's not funny at all. But I was just thinking here, you're telling us that uh, university students are good people, and you're right. And you're saying they have a good social conscience, and they are. But what I was thinking, the one thing they lack is a vision of salvation. And we all, they all looked at the uh, Jewish chaplain who said, no, it's true. He said, if you don't have some vision of what God is doing to repair the whole creation, you can't get up every day and work in a soup kitchen. It finally beats you down. In other words, everyone needs a fuller understanding and purpose of what God is doing or we lose sight of the meaning of what we're doing. If we don't have some vision of what God is doing, then it finally beats us down. We give up and we go our own way. So Mary sitting at Jesus' feet is an example of getting the big vision, the big story of what we're doing and what we're all about. And so when we come to church and we listen, we're getting a bigger vision instead of just a myopic, closed view of all the things we're doing. We need purpose and meaning. And every single one of us wants purpose and meaning in our life. We need to have it fit together into the bigger picture. One of the questions that I've often asked elderly when I served in the nursing home as a chaplain, when your life is done, do you feel like you've done something? Do you feel like you've accomplished something? Have you left a legacy of some sort? So you see the difference? Doing this and that and everything is meaningless until it fits together into what God has called us to do. And many of us get distracted because we don't listen. The book of James and we don't read that too often, a quote from the book of James, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. And then he says, religion is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphan and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So we hear from Jesus what our lives are for as we gather together and then we go out and serve to make a difference in the world. We are God's hands and feet. God is in heaven. We are here. He has called us to be his hands and feet in this world. He expects and wants us to help touch and make a difference in other people's lives. That's what he calls us to do. I have a friend, her name is Joanne Nielsen, and uh, she always played for p piano for me at my chapel services in the nursing home in Chisago City, Minnesota. Every summer, every summer, she pulled together a mission trip with other ladies, and they flew to Fort Yukon, Alaska, and provided vacation Bible school for the Native Americans every year. And I assume she's doing it this year if she's still got her health about her. She listened to Jesus' feet and she went and did something with the gifts that God had given her. Now I'm, I hear stories from you. You told me there's probably more, but some of you have been on mission trips to third world countries and drilled wells to make water 
available to villages, I don't know where, Nicaragua or some of these Latin American countries. Some of you would have done that. I'm told that there were uh, mission trips to, to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles in which you took part in a food kitchen. Is that right? Pastor Heather was here, and you did that. A week ago, when I went to Meadowbrook in Chatech to visit Dorothea Larson, I unexpectedly ran into Gladys Husset and Deborah Schieffer. And they come regularly to visit Dorothy. They bring her the CD from the church service because she doesn't have, um, she doesn't have uh, a phone or anything like that. And you know what? We all celebrated Holy Communion together. And I think there's others that are listening and then quietly go and do something that's meaningful and purposeful. And today, essentially what we're doing is we're listening at Jesus' feet, taking in all of his teaching, the bigger picture, to make a difference. And Jesus wants us to make a difference to our families, to our neighbors, to our community, and even the world. And so, now go. Go and make a difference now that we have listened. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's take our bulletins out and we're going to sing Jesus the very thought of you. I invite you to stand as you're able as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the intercessory prayers. 
United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Ever-present God in Christ, you fill all things. As your church gathers to hear your word, share your meal, and receive your blessing, teach us to welcome strangers as we have welcomed you. God of grace, hear our prayer. Through Christ you created all things, visible and invisible. Teach humankind to honor and protect all creation, including living things that remain hidden from our eyes, such as air, atmosphere, molecules, and microscopic creatures. God of grace, hear our prayer. Through Christ you reconcile all things, Motivate those in power to end enslavement, dehumanization, or brutality of any kind, and to protect and improve the lives of indigenous peoples. God of grace, hear our prayer. Through Christ you bring peace. Assure all who are worried and distracted by many things of your constant presence. Soothe those suffering in mind, body, or spirit, Especially we pray for Gary and Lonnie and Ray and Lila and Ruth. Sustain all who are afflicted and those who serve as caregivers. God of grace, hear our prayer. In Christ, you make your word fully known. Inspire this worshiping community, New Scandinavia Lutheran, to abide fully in your word as we sit at the feet of Jesus. Bless the ministry of teachers and Bible study leaders as well. God of grace, hear our prayer. In Christ, you brought forth the firstborn from the dead. We give thanks for the saints who have gathered at your table. Gather us with them in your eternal glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Again, we do not pass the offering here. We have the offering plate in the back of the church as well as the, the noisy offering. The Lord wants you to know that um, he thanks you for your gifts to his work for, and for the mission and the ministry here in this congregation. Thank you. We pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious love, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped and given thanks. He gave to them saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.